pica. This is a new vineyard planted in 2018. So it's still very young. Um, so I'm trying to assess the potential harvest for this year by looking at the baby grapes pre-flowering, which will give me an idea for how much fruit we might get this year. You are not dreaming. This azure sky is indeed an English one, and Ian Kellett is a 100% British winemaker. Pika. A financial whiz who took a huge gamble. He invested 27 million euros to create his vineyard, 100 kilometers south of London. The grape varieties are the same as in Champagne, and this is not by chance. So we're in the Bassin de Paris here. Uh, geologically, that's how we sit. Um, and so we have, yes, exactly the same land as Champagne, but, but our climate is a little cooler. It's maybe 5% or so cooler than Champagne. And because of global warming, that 5% could be an advantage instead of a disadvantage. I would say that within 100 years, it's quite likely, as I stand here today with the experience we have, that England will make more sparkling wine than champagne in 100 years' time. So you're very confident? I am, otherwise I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing, yeah. Based in the heart of his vineyard, Ian is a pioneer of English wine. His wife, Anna, also worked in finance. 20 years ago, they left their offices in the city for Hambledon, a town of 900 inhabitants, to start a family and perhaps an empire. I come from north of England. I studied biochemistry at university in London. And then I went to work in the food industry. And at that time, I bought a house in the Charente Maritime and fell in love with Bordeaux and the wines of Bordeaux. That inspired me to um, buy this vineyard here. It was an enormous challenge. I liked challenges. A challenge in life is a good thing. On 80 hectares of land, Ian produces sparkling wine. It's a kind of English champagne without the name, as the French appellation is closely protected. Chalky soil, identical grape varieties. Even his machines come from the champagne industry. Uh, so this is a coquard pressoir. Uh, champagne has developed the best pressing systems in the world um, for making sparkling wine. So we use that knowledge and the technical excellence of champagne to, to help us to develop our products. This three centuries old French tradition. Has inspired the English winemaker in his cellar. We've built an underground wine cellar cut down into the chalk. We aim to put in around 2 million bottles of stock Siolat all hand-stacked seal that like this. A regular bottle has about 50 million bubbles, and I haven't had added up how many bubbles that means there are in the cellar, but it's all it's billions and billions and billions of bubbles. In half a century, English vineyards have grown from just one to 800. Their aim is 40 million bottles in 15 years, half of which will be sparkling wine. How did this French heritage end up in the land of France's best enemy? Global warming. In 50 years, the south of England has warmed nearly two degrees. So it is now as warm as Champagne was 50 years ago. A climate that is conducive to growing vines and to investment. The United Kingdom has another advantage. Brits are crazy about Champagne. They are the second largest consumers in the world after the French. And all they want is to drink their own wine.
While there are clear skies on the horizon for English wine growers, for the French, the climate is starting to become a problem. Je vais changer mes chaussures. Christelle Rinville is the manager of the second largest vineyard in Champagne. Every day, she walks through some of its 288 hectares of vines. She is watchful of the whims of the weather. Ça va, Yann? Ça va, ça va. Ça va presque pas mouiller, hein? Non, ben non, non, non. C'est vraiment insignifiant. Ouais, puis je... c'est dommage pour la fleur. Hein. Bah oui, ça tombe mal. Ouais, ça se voit là. J'ai l'impression qu'on est au moins en été. Avec la sécheresse, euh... bah, l'herbe, l'herbe est... est sèche comme en été, alors qu'on est qu'au mois de mai. Enfin, on est un peu inquiet. J'espère qu'il qu tombe un petit peu d'eau quand même de temps en temps. Et notamment en ce moment, on, est, on a besoin d'eau pour les, pour les plantations parce que nos, nos jeunes plants ont besoin d'eau pour, euh, bah, pour fabriquer des racines et pouvoir se développer. Donc voilà. Je ne suis pas du tout du milieu viticole. J'ai fait des études scientifiques euh, euh, universitaires. Ne connaissant pas le vignoble ni la champagne, en quelques mois, je suis complètement tombée amoureuse et, et de la champagne et du vignoble. Et euh, j'ai su à ce moment-là qu que ce serait mon métier. C'est important de voir le résultat de ce qu'on fait chaque jour. C'est gratifiant, parfois décourageant, mais souvent gratifiant. Champagne has been the benchmark for sparkling wines since the 18th century. Today, only 300 houses keep this heritage alive and make it shine throughout the world. The turnover was 5.5 billion euros in 2021, a record year. In Rheims, the capital of Champagne, Christelle produces nearly 7 million bottles a year. Et est-ce que tu as tous les bons de livraison parce que moi il m'en manque hein, je les ai pas tous ça. Hein. But in 2015, management had an idea that may seem surprising. A new vineyard in England. Lorsqu'on m'a demandé de superviser le vignoble anglais, euh, le vignoble du domaine Évremont, ben j'ai dit euh, d'accord, <laughs> pas de problème. <laughs> Ça permet d'avoir une ouverture sur un autre monde, un autre terroir, d'autres techniques. C'est une ouverture d'esprit intéressante. An opening of the mind and the opening of a promising market. Christelle has also become a pioneer of English wine. Twice a month. She travels back and forth between Champagne and Kent, the new El Dorado for wine producers. And now? And now, there's no patience for a half an hour, and we'll be on the other side in a half an hour. So it's the moment to work on his computer, to send mails, or to do a little siesta to recover. Since Brexit, the British are very keen on domestic products, but they still need to discover them. John Mobbs is on a mission to become one of the UK's leading wine critics. During the week, John works for a major biscuit company, but on the weekends, he goes to tastings at festivals. Hi there everybody, it's John from Great British Wine. I'm here at the Wine Garden of England Festival in Scurry's Court, tasting some great English wines, uh, English sparkling and English still. Um, I'll post about some of my favourites in due course. Um, beautiful day for it. John, who is self-taught, launched his website in 2015. He takes his passion very seriously. So this festival is a really uh, interesting opportunity to, to both meet the producers, uh, but also see how the public interacts with the wine. So for me, as somebody who's trying to focus on communicating to the public, 
I like to see also how the public responds to the wines that I particularly like. I'd like to think that we're, we're all contributing to a, to a part of history in the winemaking world. It would be great to just try the, the two sparklings today. Um, yeah, sure. Because you've moved sure. to non-vintage on the on the classic. Um, yeah, yeah. John's perseverance is beginning to pay off. In the new world that is emerging across the channel, he's already setting the standard. It's refreshing, um, but it has that nice lick of complexity. That's great. I mean, it's, it's a really served a fantastic um, uh, place in, the, in uh, educating and communicating with people about English wine, and the passion comes through. The shop I was buying the wine from suggested to me, why don't I try English sparkling wine? So I bought a bottle and went home and tried it and thought, wow, this is, this is fantastic. I'd love to one day be traveling internationally and creating opportunities to introduce English wine to people that haven't tried it. It would be what my ultimate goal would, like, would be one day. But I think we've got a, a way to go until I get to that stage. John is comfortable with his patriotism. He is always ready to stand up for his country. From a particularly warm and abundant uh, vintage. Just like the eight producers from Kent who have joined forces for this festival, this is not a time for competition, but for conquest. Henry. How are you doing? Great to see you. Yeah, you too. Great day for it. Uh, great to be back at Squirrel's Court. The organiser is enjoying the 2022 vintage of his festival. Ironically, he owes this success to a French brand, Christelle's. The really surprising thing about the festival and the whole wine garden of England's summer festival is that the concept actually came from Champagne. So when uh, Tattinger, Domaine Evermont, planted, they had the attention of the global press. It was a big story, you know, a champagne house coming to Kent. And for growers in Kent, we weren't quite sure how that was going to play out. But Tattinger, they, they said, hey, come and we've got the global press here. Come and taste your, come and open your wines and show them what we can do as a region. And they were the catalyst to the wine garden of England. So we have a lot to thank Tattinger for. Christelle's house has a vested interest in the recognition of English sparkling wine. For the manager of the new winery, every trip to England is a trip through the looking glass. Here she drives on the left, and the great story of her wine is yet to be written. It's joli, no? Entre les vergers, les haies, qu'on appelle les windbreaks, couper le vent. Il y en a partout ici. Nous sommes arrivés en Angleterre à Chilham. Bienvenue. In this region, only the Romans dared to plant vines 1,800 years ago. How are you? Hello. <laughs> Hello. Yes. Good. Nice to see you. And you? You well? Yeah. I don't know for you, but uh, in Champagne there is no water in. Uh, no, no, what, no rain. Yeah, no rain. Uh... Not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Not a problem. <laughs> Plenty of rain. <laughs> Today, they must start from scratch and foster expertise. Jason and Mark are orchard experts, but until recently, they had never grown grapes. How many leaves? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I love working in the vineyards. It's, um, we, Jason and I have always grown apples and pears and strawberries and raspberries and blueberries and blackberries and plums uh, and so for us to now take our experience of growing fruit in England and grow vines with the benefit of Christelle's incredible knowledge and our knowledge of the growing environment here has been really fun it's been really interesting C'est ça qui est excitant c'est qu'on est sur un terroir que l'on ne connaît pas on apprend à le connaître et on essaye de de placer les vignes dans les meilleures conditions pour qu'elles expriment ce terroir et donc 
la, la, la découverte sera dans les vins qu que l'on va avoir. On va essayer de sublimer les vins pour que le terroir de Chilam euh, soit bien présent dans, dans, dans les vins. Do you understand me? Oui, absolument. Juste. <laughs> On 70 hectares, Christelle's future vineyard has a taste for experimentation. Hello. Hello, Hello how are you? Hello. Hey guys, Good morning. morning. Investing in England also has an advantage. Here, land costs 50 times less than in Champagne. Enough to see the bigger picture, like the future winery of the estate on 1400 meters squared. En face, c'est le c'est la préparation du terrain dans lequel nous allons implanter notre winery. Euh, on est assez excité parce que ça fait très longtemps qu'on attendait les autorisations. Donc on les a et les travaux vont ont démarré. Donc euh, je suis assez ému parce que voilà, j'aurais vu la, la naissance du projet Winery. Christelle's work here is just beginning. The first bottles from the Anglo-French estate are expected in 2024. In the race for this new market, Ian Kellett has a head start. He's been making wine for 10 years, and he's learning fast. One, two, three grams per liter, two yeah, grams per yeah, yeah. liter. So zero, one, two, two three. His two enologists join him at a key moment, finding the right sugar dosage. This will decide the classification on the label, semi-dry, dry, or brute. No, I prefer the zero five. I'm not looking forward to this. It's a crucial moment to find favor with British consumers. It's like an almond croissant with ice and sugar on top and a little twist of lemon curd on the side with a sprinkle of salt. Like a third dimension to it. Yeah. And you dropped it on the ground yeah. on the chalk. And you, picked it up <laughs> you picked it up from the chalk. Yeah. The English are fond of brute sparkling wines. So Ian opts for a small dose of sugar. He hopes his wine will one day replace the famous bottle of champagne. It's a great day, fraptious day. This wine is probably the best premier cuvee we've made so far. So we intend to release this wine probably in October, November 2022, just in time for Christmas. So you should be able to have it on your table this Christmas, that would be the idea. Great Cheers work. To Good work. Life. The English winemaker is obviously an optimist by nature, but he knows he has hit gold. Hambledon is an estate steeped in British history. I think they're the harvest in the in sixties. The English love to not be too exposed to the sun, so you know <laughs> she's wearing out to keep her. They're actually harvesting. The first vines were planted here in 1952 by an English general. And again, there are French people involved. Major generals, he went to the war in France, to the First World War. The French officers shared their wine rations with a young Sir Guy. And because of that, he found a love of wine and a love of the French. In 1951, after the Second World War, he just bought this house. And it was his stepson who said, well, you've always loved wine, you've always loved the French. Um, it's a south-facing chalk slope. How about you go and plant a vineyard? Hambledon is England's leading commercial vineyard, and the Kellets intend to use this as a selling point for their wine. They already see themselves as a winemaking dynasty. I actually can't believe that it's happening, so very proud. And, um, you know, I do hope that my girls will become part of the business in the future. It's a, it's a great business, so very, very exciting, yes. Hi there, it's John from Great British Wine here. We're looking forward to another English Wine Night this Friday and the team will be getting onto Instagram Live once again and chatting through some of our favourite English wines from the southeast of England. The history of English wine is just beginning to be written and John does everything he can to write several pages of it every week in his little house in the suburbs of London, not far from his daughter's stuffed animals. For the moment, he doesn't make any money from his new passion, 
but producers provide him with their bottles, happy to appear on his website. This wine has a very subtle but prominent floral note, which suggests this is not made from the classical champagne. Especially as John is never hard on the UK's wines. I'm trying to talk about the positivity, the differences in the wines, and um, find wines that I'm enjoying to talk about. Because if I don't enjoy the wine, if I don't like it, I'm not going to be very passionate in what I write about it. So there's not any point in writing a review. I prefer to look at myself as, as a, an ambassador, a self-appointed ambassador. There is no doubt in his mind that England will soon have a spot on wine lists. A process sped up by French producers bringing their credibility to the table. It's been really exciting to see the arrival of the Champagne houses in England. Pommery recently I went over to visit, so it was a great chance to connect with both the French winemaking team, but also see the perspective of things in England. The other big name in England is Tattinger. Um, I was very lucky enough to be invited to the planting of one of their vineyards a couple of years back. Uh, is Domaine Evermond. This is me. This is me planting a vine of Pinot Noir, I believe it was. While waiting for the Anglo-French estates to enter the market, Ian already produces 500,000 bottles per year. That will be our top wine, so that's our premier cuvee. This figure will increase as his young vines mature. In the meantime, Ian intends to develop his estate. While his restaurant is still under construction, he is testing the concept under this tent. How's it going, chef? Yeah, go yourself. Okay, very well. Oh, yeah. To combine his wine with gastronomy, he hired Nick Edgar, a Michelin-starred chef. This is a, a little crab salad with um, a grapefruit jelly, some avocado, some baby cucumbers. Um, it's going to be then finished with an avocado sorbet and some seaweed. A gourmet meal in the middle of the vineyards, like in France or California, is unheard of here. First course, um, it's a dressed crab salad, so I've basically taken the white... The Champagne War is well and truly on. Ici, c'était le nouveau épinay, ici. Parce que le global warming arrivé ici. Épinay? Épinay, ici. Champagne. New champagne. New champagne for the world is here in England. These guys know what they're doing, so... Ian puts as much energy into producing his wine as he does into shaping his brand. And we only make four wines, so they're fairly easy to remember. This group is one of the first guided tours in Hambledon. So I usually start with a little bit of history of Hambledon itself until he retired in 1994. They weren't making a huge amount of wine because it was only 10 acres, but the quality was pretty good. It was good enough that the Queen served them, they were served at Parliament House, and in 1984, Promoting the history of the estate means giving it a heritage base, synonymous with great wine. Most of the vines that you can see here behind you are the original 2004 plantings, so they're about 18 years old. I think we can take the best of Champagne and the best of Napa and combine them. And, and what I mean by that is I think we can make truly world-class sparkling wines with great finesse, elegance, accuracy, precision, persistence, length. So that will be the champagne piece. But I think we can build a wine tourism experience much more like Napa. So people visit the vineyards in Napa, they fall in love with the vineyards, they buy the wines, they, they have lunch there. And I think we can put those two things together. So we have lots of reasons to be confident for the future, I think. For the time being, Ian is focusing on the English market, and almost all of his visitors are Brits. Oh, it smells lovely. The tasting is accompanied by crackers and English cheese. Mm. What do you think? It's lovely. It's very crisp, very fresh. It really is a good palate cleanser. Um, I can't taste the apple. Loads of flavour in there. It's a very easy drinking, I think, sitting out in the garden on a lovely sunny afternoon with a glass of 
this would be just wonderful looking over a lovely scenery. We've got some champagne. My daughter and I shared a bottle and it was really lovely. I this actually, no. But I think I prefer this one to the bottle of champagne that we actually had that night. Yes. Yeah. It's the wine. English sparkling wines are not cheap. 25 euros a bottle on average. The British buy 90% of the national production. All that remains is to convince the rest of the world. Brilliant. Thank Enjoy you the so rest much. of your day. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Christelle is back in France. Est-ce que vous sentez l'odeur de la fleur de vigne? C'est très très subtil, c'est très très fin. Despite the increasing competition, Champagne is doing very well thanks to exports. Last year it was up 30% in Europe and 40% in the rest of the world. Bonjour messieurs dames. But it's never easy to stay number 1 especially when the rules of the game change. Ça patine un peu nous là. Euh, ah, on a dû faire pas bien et là ça va pas bien. L'air fait froid en plus donc ouais. euh, ça va bloquer un petit peu. More and more often, climate destabilizes production. Il yeah, faut pas s'attendre à faire une grande grande récolte cette année. Il faut imaginer l'avenir, si la, la température moyenne continue à augmenter comme ça, peut-être qu'un jour, effectivement, on sera confronté à des vendanges beaucoup trop chaudes qui vont changer la typicité des vins. On va être peut-être confronté à, euh, voilà, à des problèmes parasitaires, ou je ne sais pas, euh, ou d'adaptation de la vigne beaucoup plus difficile. Euh, et, et donc, tout, tous ces phénomènes-là doivent être anticipés. The French wine industry has been trying to find a solution to climate change for 20 years. Most of the producers, including Christelle's house, have joined forces to defend their interests at the Champagne Committee. Arnaud Descôtes is an engineer and technical director of this committee. His mission, to ensure a future for Champagne. Ça va? Ça va et toi? Ouais. Ça se passe bien? Ça se passe bien, oui, oui. On a prévu de faire quel croisement avec Chardonnay? Également croisé avec euh, du Pinot Noir et du Meunier, oui. These Champagne hillsides are the committee's genetic laboratory. Here, agronomists manipulate the grape varieties. Vous voyez, c'est un travail qui réclame beaucoup de précision, beaucoup de minutie. Il s'agit d'enlever une à une toutes les étamines, donc les parties mâles de l'inflorescence. On enlève avec une pince à épiler chacune des étamines. J'élimine les, les capuchons floraux pour ne laisser que la partie femelle de la fleur, puisque la fleur de vigne est hermaphrodite. Le but du jeu est d'apporter le, le pollen, c'est-à-dire la partie mâle, euh, en espérant une fécondation et donc une hybridation. Et euh, l'objectif, c'est d'obtenir une nouvelle variété résistante aux principales maladies de la vigne, mildiou et diam, adaptée au changement climatique et à typicité champagne. Pratiquement terminé. Oui, j'ai terminé. Je vérifie toujours à la fin euh, qu'il ne reste pas un, un bouton. Il y a quoi dedans Donc là, c'est du pollen qui se trouve dans le tube. Donc l'idée, c'est de venir en mettre vraiment partout. C'est exactement, oui, comme une insémination artificielle, puisque là, en plus, on aura choisi le parent mâle, le parent femelle. Euh, et on... par contre, on ne sait absolument pas ce qu'on va obtenir comme descendance. Ce qu'on utilise aujourd'hui comme technique, c'est la même technique qui était utilisée à la fin du 19e siècle. On prend le pollen qui nous intéresse, on force un petit peu la nature et on obtient, euh, via les pépins, des nouvelles variétés de vignes. Christelle's next vintages, and perhaps an entire industry, depend on these few experimental hectares. Terminé. C'est terminé. On croise les doigts On croise les doigts. Salut Magali. On the other side of the channel, hearts are lighter. John wants to play. He has invited his friend George, who works for an English winemaker, for a blind tasting. Yeah, George, if you could just uh, shuffle the bottles around um, without me looking. Match of the day. 
France, England. In rugby, this is called the crunch. But in wine, it was unimaginable a few years ago. Two English sparkling wines, two champagnes, uh, served blind. Do so we overall enjoy the most? So wine number one, George. Um, cheers to the tasting. Let's see how we get on. John and George play at recognising the origin of the wines. It's got a, yeah, really classic, yeah, classic nose. Uh, quite fresh, quite fragrant. Um, Some English sparkling wines are now very similar to champagnes. I think it's a really nice champagne, personally. I might be wrong. It's definitely a, a well-made quality sparkling wine. Uh, nice creamy mousse, soft bubbles. Very good. As for the marks, our two specialists are very generous with all the wines tasted. I'm going to put in that as a 15 out of 20. A tactful way of not offending anyone. Let's see. Uh, we're going to do a reveal. It was indeed the Alfred Rothschild Blanc de Blanc. It is indeed the Aldbury Estate. But number four was also our favourite wine, um, which means that it was the Bride Valley Blanc de Blanc 2018, um, which was on record the very best uh, vintage of English wine in, in recent era. The winner, an English sparkling wine from 2018, a very good year in the short history of UK wines. French producers have the advantage of a 300-year head start if we do a tasting like this, in my experience, you get people say, I think the English wine is very good, it's as good as the champagne, but if they're buying a bottle of wine to take to a special occasion, somebody's birthday party, a wedding, they still want to have the brand value of the champagne. Most people would agree the English are just as good, which is nice, so we can compete. The brand value is something which takes a long time to establish. Fantastic. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers to many more. Absolutely. We'll do it again. With no hang-ups and with a climate that continues to warm up, it surely won't take centuries for the English to compete with Champagne on its favourite terrain, the wine of choice for all big events. <laughs>